Okay, the minimum wage, typically the way they ask Ron Paul a question is they sort of roll their eyes and they say, you jerk, you can't uh, believe this, can you? And, and surely you uh, favor the minimum wage law, don't you? And uh, Ron Paul gets uh, 25 seconds, 30 seconds to say why he is against the minimum wage law. And it seems as if he's unduly cruel. I mean, the minimum wage law sounds like a good idea. I mean, we have poverty, we have poor people. What's the key element of poor people? Well, they have low wages. Well, then the obvious answer is raise their wages. I mean, who could be against that in, except a misanthrope like Ron Paul who hates the poor would be the implication. Well, the minimum wage law is not a, a beneficial law. It's not a, a way to help the poor. It's a way to hurt the poor. Uh, first of all, why be so niggardly about it? Why be so cheap? If the minimum wage law is really good, why raise it to $7 an hour? Why not 70 or 700 I mean, by the stroke of a legislative pen or of a, a presidential pen, uh, we could all be rich. And we can go home and we wouldn't have any problems. There'd be no poverty. Why can't we just legislate ourselves out of poverty and by having a minimum wage? Well, a moment's thought, you realize you have to ask, well, why does an employer want to hire an employee in the first place? Well, because of the productivity of the worker. And he's trying to earn a profit off the worker because if he doesn't earn a profit, he goes broke. And if the worker is worth $5 an hour, and he has to pay $7 an hour for him, that means he loses $2 an hour for every hour that the guy is on his shop floor. Now, that's a recipe for disaster. That's a recipe for bankruptcy. That's not a recipe for creating jobs. Suppose there were no minimum wage law, and uh, employers uh, would offer a very, very low wage. Now, since all employers are trying to exploit the poor, uh, and they're, they're very vicious. What would be the first offer that a, an employer would offer for a worker with no minimum wage? The answer would, well, the, the real answer would be minus infinity. Namely, he would demand that the worker pay him an infinite amount of money for the privilege of working for him. But let's forget about that. That's too risque. Let's go for a penny an hour. Penny an hour is pretty good. Uh, so the employer offers the employee a penny an hour, and how much profit is he now making off of this uh, worker? Remember, the worker's productivity is $5 an hour. He's making $4.99. Well, that's pretty good. But there's another employer out there. The other employer sort of applauds the first employer and says, yes, you're exploiting workers, that's great. Uh, I'm with you in principle, but there's a slight glitch here, and that is you are making the $4.99 off of him, and while I like the idea of exploiting workers, I don't like the idea of you doing it, I'll do it. So what wage will I offer? The second uh, employer will offer two cents an hour, making $4.98. Well, then there's somebody else out there who's going to bid it up to three cents an hour. Sometimes I ask my students this, and they say a dollar an hour. I say, you're no capitalist pig. You've got to exploit workers. You've got to go low. But you can see where I'm heading, one, two, three, five cents, ten cents, up to a dollar, up to two dollars. The bidding will stop at around five dollars an hour. Namely, you, your salary is determined by your productivity. And if you want to raise people's salary, you raise their productivity. You don't raise their wages or the, the compel employers to pay higher wages than they're worth. Otherwise, you don't get jobs. Now, the way, th this is sort of magical thinking, that by dint of a pen we can do things. Uh, the child labor laws, they're always saying, well, you know, if the legislature didn't pass child labor laws, uh, we'd still have children working. No, we don't have children working because we're rich enough now so that children don't have to work. But suppose they had passed child labor laws in the, in the 15th century. Well, then the kids who are working and living would have died because we were so poor in the 15th century that we needed everyone to work. So what happened as you go the 15th, the 18th, the 19th century, we get richer and richer, and the legislature keep passing, keeps passing more and more child labor laws, taking credit for the, fa for the fact that we're richer and now we can afford to have children not work. It's the same thing with maximum hours legislation. There was this very famous Lochner case, L-O-C-H-N-E-R. 
And the idea here is the reason we only have to work 35, 30, 40 hours a week instead of 120 hours a week to keep body and soul together is because we're richer. We have more recipes, we have more knowledge, more capital. But if they had passed the law in the 1700s saying you couldn't work more than 35 hours a day, uh, 35 hours a week, people would have died. Nowadays, if you pass child labor legislation in very poor countries, what they find is that the kids have to stop working making t-shirts and sneakers, and either they starve or become prostitutes. Well, that's not cool. That's not good. This is magical thinking. A lot of people think a minimum wage law is a law under wages, and the higher you raise it, the higher wages are, and that's the model that they're using, totally wrong. Rather, the model, the correct model, if you want to use a mechanistic model, is a barrier over which you have to jump to get a job, and the higher the minimum wage law is, the harder it is to get a job. Now, I used to illustrate this when I was a young man by taking a chair like this and jumping over it to illustrate that you have to jump over a barrier in order to get a job. But then our days are long gone where I can jump over a chair. Then what I did is I took this attaché case and I put it up like that and I jumped over that. A decade later, I put it like this and I jumped over that. Now, what I'm going to do is put it flat <laughs> and I'm going to jump over it and I want a hand of applause if I make it. If I don't, you can boo me. And I'm going to put it on the floor. The people in the front of the room can see whether I can actually jump over this or not. So. We should really have a drum roll. Do we have any? No, no drum rolls. <laughs> now, I need a long lead to get over this. That's what they do in, in the Olympics. I don't like to brag, but that was a pretty good jump. <laughs> The point is you have to jump over something to get a job. And there are certain people that have low productivity and can't get over the hurdle of a minimum wage, and they would have disproportionately high unemployment. Now, the unemployment rate for everybody on average, 9.1, 9.6, it's around there. The Shadow Open Market Committee, the Shadow Statistics, put it at around 16% which I think is more realistic because they take into account the discouraged worker and count them as unemployed. Boy, I'm out of breath from that run. I'm just kidding. <laughs> but what's the unemployment rate for teenagers? Much higher than the average. What's the unemployment rate for black people? Much higher. What's the unemployment rate for black teenagers? Something like 50%, 5 -0, not 1-5. This is horrendous. This is a racist law. And yet, we've got a black president who is presiding over minimum wage and trying to raise it, and um, he's hurting his own community. He's a traitor, a race traitor, maybe. What determines marginal revenue product or productivity? What determines it are two things. One is human capital, how much smarts you've got inside yourself. And if you get a job at $5 an hour and you get on the job training and you learn something, you raise your productivity, you learn how to come, on to, uh, come to work on time, you learn to get along with customers, with fellow workers, to listen to the boss, things like that. And if you're unemployed, well, you get bored and you go uh, do some criminal behavior and you end up in jail, and that's not a good recipe either. The other way to raise productivity is to have more capital, physical capital. Why is it that we in the United States are richer, have a higher productivity, higher wages than people in Mexico? One of the reasons is we have more capital. Look, when the Mexicans come here, all of a sudden their productivity rises. When we go to Mexico, our productivity falls because they have less capital to work with than we have here. Look, uh, if you want to build a building, the way we build a building here is with 10 or 15 or 20 people with steam shovels. The way they uh, dig a, a hole for the building in other countries is uh, 3,000 guys with picks and shovels. So, of course, our couple of dozen workers are going to be more productive. Well, what determines the level of, of, uh, of capital? What determines the level of capital is savings. 
And what is the Fed doing with uh, interest rates, which determine savings or which is a big impetus for savings? It's keeping them around zero. So the savings are falling. And what determines savings uh, even apart from interest rates? Well, uh, security. What we have is what Robert Higgs calls uh, re regime uncertainty. Nobody knows what's going on. Nobody knows what Obama's going to do next. So people aren't saving. 